Gwyneth Paltrow, mirroring Taylor Swift. The current trial involving Gwyneth Paltrow provides us with another opportunity to see a narcissist in action. Not only understanding various facets of narcissism played out, but also enabling many of you to understand that the reason why she says what she says and does what she does is being governed by her narcissism. Gabriel Pogrand writes in the Times, Gwyneth Paltrow, everything you need to know about her ski crash trial. I'm going to take you through some of the detail, focusing specifically on mirroring Taylor Swift. She is the Oscar-winning actress, wellness guru and globally renowned businesswoman worth an estimated $200 million. Substantial residual benefit there. He is the retired optometrist who accuses her of a violent hit-and-run collision on a ski slope that left him with four broken ribs, psychological distress and permanent brain damage. Threat to control by those allegations. As last week's legal showdown demonstrated, Gwyneth Paltrow, 50, and Terry Sanderson, 76, do not agree on much. But one thing is beyond dispute. The staid courtroom of Park City, Utah, is a world away from the flawless runs, slopeside hot tubs and apres ski champagne yurts of nearby Deer Valley. It is one of the most spectacular and sought-after resorts in North America, where, more than seven years ago, on February 26, 2016, the pair were skiing down a beginner's green run at the same time and in the same place. What happened next is the subject of a years-long and increasingly rancorous lawsuit in which Sanderson demanded more than $3.1 million in compensation, since downgraded by a judge to $300,000 for the physical damage allegedly caused to him by her negligent behaviour on the ski slope. Sanderson, who was a divorced father of three daughters, says he can no longer maintain relationships or enjoy life, and has gone from being outgoing to agitated and anxious. Paltrow, the Shakespeare in Love star and founder of the wellness firm Goop, has launched her own counterclaim for just one dollar, plus legal fees, nullification of threat to control through denial, assertion of control with counterclaim. Testifying in the dock for more than two hours last week, she accused Sanderson of being the one who crashed into her and said he was lying in a cynical attempt to exploit her fame and riches. Now, either that is correct, and she's telling the truth, and she uses the truth in order to nullify the threat to control that's being posed by Mr. Sanderson's lawsuit, or she's lying It is engaging in projection, denial, nullification of threat to control to get rid of the threat that's posed by Mr. Sanderson's lawsuit. Gwyneth Paltrow's account is that two skis came between her skis, forcing her legs apart, and there was a body pressing against her. Then, after a few seconds, they fell to the right. Terry Sanderson's account is that she was skiing recklessly at the time and that she was distracted by her son Moses, who was age nine, and that Paltrow hit him directly, Sanderson, in the back. The tips of the skis go out and he goes face down, spread eagled, with Paltrow on top of him. The televised trial, which has been watched by millions and expected to last eight days in total, has touched on so much. The power and burden of celebrity the nature of ageing, the rules of mountain etiquette, even Paltrow's friendship with the singer-songwriter Taylor Swift. But it is ultimately about something simple. What did, or it did not happen, on a ski slope more than half a decade ago? Paltrow and Sanderson both accept that they had an entanglement of sorts on the slope. The central question being examined in court is who caused it. On the afternoon in question, Paltrow was on holiday with her then-boyfriend, intimate partner, primary source, TV producer Brad Falchuk, 52, to whom she's now married, his two children, non-intimate secondary sources, and her offspring, non-intimate secondary sources, 
Apple, then 11, and Moses, age 9, and also her ex-husband, the co-play singer Chris Martin, former intimate partner primary source. The aim of the holiday was to see whether their families could blend as they made new lives together, and of course, facade management for Gwyneth Paltrow. In the early afternoon, Paltrow claimed she and her group were heading down to a restaurant for lunch when she felt someone skiing into her bag. At first, she alleged she feared the person behind might have been sexually assaulting her. See immediate parts passing for my observations about that. She told the court last week, two skis came between my skis, forcing my legs apart, and there was a body pressing against me, and there was a very strange groaning noise. The actress said, this is a practical joke. Is someone doing something perverted? She continued, it was probably a few seconds, and then we fell to the right. Somebody must have caught an edge. I fell on his body. The pair tumbled to the ground together, and one was spooning as they crashed, she said. After recovering from the collision, Paltrow screamed, you ski directly into my fucking bag, language for which she apologised in court last week, and which at the time she feared her young son might hear. She said that Sanderson, still on the ground, responded by mumbling apologetically, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Sanderson has provided a diametrically different story. He says it was Paltrow who ploughed into him, and it is even said to have compared her to the prehistoric reptilian monster Godzilla, challenge fuel. His lawyers argue that the actress was skiing recklessly at the time as she was distracted by Moses, who was further up the slope from her. According to the deposition of one person present, her son, who was skiing with his own instructor, Eric Christensen, had been pleading for her attention, exclaiming, Mama, Mama, watch me. I don't believe that he went, Mama, just killed a man. It was then suggested that Paltrow turned around to look at him, causing her to lose focus. So these are the diametrically opposed positions of the two. But where does Taylor Swift come into all of this? Well, last week, Kristen Van Orman, Mr. Sanderson's attorney, suggested that Paltrow got the idea of symbolically countersuing Sanderson in order to mirror the pop star Taylor Swift. In 2013, Swift, now 33, was sued by David Mueller, a DJ, who argued he had unfairly lost his job at a radio station because she had falsely accused him of sexual assault during a pre-concert meet and greet. Threat to control by bringing a lawsuit. Swift responded to Mueller's defamation lawsuit by countersuing him, arguing he had attacked her and demanding damages of one dollar. After jurors concluded the two-year case by ruling in her favour, a number of fans at Swiss concerts waved around dollar bills in homage to the nominal but symbolic damages she received. Asked if she knew about the case, Paltrow said, I had not been familiar with it, but now I am. Paltrow was then asked if she and Swift, 33, had ever exchanged intimate gifts an apparent reference to a 2021 advert for her lifestyle brand Goop, which saw her place a vibrator in a bag addressed to the pop star. The actress was forced to explain they were not good friends. We are friendly. I've taken our kids to one of her concerts before, but we talk talk very often. Now, of course, the inference is that if she was sticking a vibrator in a bag and sending it to Taylor Swift, that they were pretty good friends because that's a very intimate gift to send somebody. Ordinarily, such a proposition would be correct, but when it comes to a narcissist behaving that way, no, the narcissist will be over-familiar. A narcissist often believing that you're really good friends with the narcissist even though you've just met, believing that you want to sleep with the narcissist even though you've just met, that you're BFFs even though you've only just met. And as a consequence of a sense of entitlement, an absence of boundary recognition, poor accountability for their behaviours, it's entirely likely that a narcissist who doesn't know somebody but that well would send them a vibrator. Accordingly, for Paltrow to suggest we're friendly but we're not good friends may well indeed be accurate. She is likely to have sent a vibrator and has done so, of course, in order to assert control over Swift, 
but also to manage her facade, because of course that was publicised and it was done to draw fuel from the audience that saw her engaging in such a kind act, and also to assert control over that audience. They evidently know one another, but of course bear in mind they're both narcissists and there would be a clash of social narcissists. The suggestion that she mirrored Taylor Swift again has some force because that's what narcissists do. For instance, Harry's wife regularly mirrors other people by way of her character trait acquisition, the plagiarism that she engages in. Would Paltrow see what Swift had done and think, that's a good idea, I'll copy that too? There is a possibility that she would do so because that's what narcissists do. Narcissists mirror because there is no true self that's on display on a day-to-day -day basis. That's the false self. And that false self can be made up of anything and everything that's taken from other people. Shards and fragments and portions and aspects of other people's lives, which are bolted on as part of the construct by the narcissism, to then create this amalgam of lots of different pieces, which is then used to control other people. Accordingly, it is entirely feasible that Gwyneth Paltrow was aware of what Taylor Swift had done, and directed by her narcissism, she's copied her with a symbolic countersuing. She needed to countersue, of course, to nullify the threat to control posed by Mr. Sanderson's legal claim of his own, but also to engender sympathy from people, and quite possibly to utilise it in a similar way to which Taylor Swift has done, by doing it as a symbolic act to say, look, I've done nothing wrong, but I'm not being greedy about this. I've got plenty of money, so I don't, know, I don't need money from Mr. Sanderson other than the dollar in payment of my legal fee, so I'm not left out of pocket. But also, as doing that, it's almost seen to be, I'm actually not that bad a person because I could screw him over financially, but I'm not going to do so. It exhibits grandiosity. I've got plenty of money, so I don't need to take any from the little person. And also facade management in terms of doing it as a symbolic gesture because other people may then support her in that. Given the fact that narcissists mirror, there's a good chance that she has copied Taylor Swift. And the basis of doing so accords with the prime aims. I'm H.G. Tudor. Thank you for listening.